Medusa is probably one of the most recognizable figures from Greek mythology, and that's quite an accomplishment considering she isn't an actual deity. Her look is very iconic, and that's probably why she's so famous. You might be shocked though to know that our modern view of her is not how the ancient Greeks saw her. In modern representations, Medusa is often depicted as a beautiful woman with snakes for hair and everything from the waist down is a snake. This differs from how she was depicted by the ancient Greeks as seen by this pottery. Snakes for hair was originally a part of her characteristics, but other than that she's pretty different. For starters, she has regular human legs instead of a snake tail, and she also has wings, which is odd because I never see Medusa depicted with wings ever in the modern media. Her ability to turn people into stone was also an original part of her character. So while she does look different, she still acts the same way. In the same way our modern view of Medusa is different from the original, so too is our understanding of her origins. Yes, plural, origins. Now there are two origins for Medusa, a Greek one and a Roman one. I'm going to start with her Greek origin and then talk about the rest of her life. Then for the final part of this video we'll talk about her Roman origin because that requires some analysis and greater context. Medusa in Greek mythology is the daughter of Porkis, a primordial sea god, and Keto, the mother of all sea monsters. Medusa isn't the only child of these two though. She has two other sisters, and together these three make up the Gorgon sisters. Each of the sisters have the same powers and look as Medusa because they're all born that way. It doesn't say if they're triplets, but it wouldn't surprise me. There are also a few other sisters called the Gryi, but not much is written about them so they don't matter to us. Unfortunately for Medusa, despite having two divine parents and several divine siblings, she is mortal, which means she can die. Her mortality would come to bite her in the butt when Perseus came along. Perseus will get a video all about him eventually, but for now all you need to know is he's the son of Zeus, shocking I know, and he was sent on a quest by Polydictes to get the severed head of Medusa as a gift. Perseus goes on this quest, and after a little divine intervention, he's all set and ready to battle Medusa. So how does this epic clash go down, you may ask? Well, Perseus takes the easy way out and kills Medusa in her sleep. Sorry guys, no Clash of the Titans stop motion fight here. After decapitating Medusa in her sleep and fooling around with her head a little, Perseus finally gave the head to Athena, where she put it on her shield, the Aegis. Or her breastplate? Different translations say different things, so we don't know what the Aegis exactly is. We do know it protected Athena, we just don't know how. Keep that connection to Athena in mind though, because it's about to become very relevant. Most of the information regarding Medusa's origins comes from Hesiod's Theogony. Hesiod was a contemporary poet to the much more famous Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. While those two tell the story of the Trojan War and Odysseus' wild ride home, the Theogony is a bit more like an anthology. It's a collection of various stories from around Greece detailing the origins of the universe and the genealogy of the gods. This is where we get stories like the castration of Uranus and the Titanomachy. In the Theogony, there's a throwaway line where Hesiod says, Poseidon laid with Medusa in a flowery field together. That's all it says in the Greek Theogony. But when Rome incorporated the Greek religion into their own, they took this story and fleshed out that one specific part. In Roman mythology, Medusa is still the daughter of two divine beings, but she's just a regular human. No wings, no snake hair, and she's still mortal. Medusa is living as a priestess of Minerva, Athena's Roman counterpart, and one day, as she's caring for the temple, Neptune enters the building. You know how Zeus is, and Poseidon isn't too different. After the crime has been committed, Neptune leaves, but Medusa stays on the floor traumatized from the horrible event she suffered. Eventually, Minerva returns to the temple, and she finds Medusa trembling on the floor. Upon learning what happened, Minerva used her divine powers to turn Medusa into the snake-haired, stone-gazing monster we know today. Some people have chosen to view this as a way of Minerva making it so that no man could ever take advantage of Medusa again. But if you look at what Ovid wrote, it says... Then, for a fitting punishment, Minerva transformed the Gorgo's lovely hair into loathsome snakes. Yes, you heard that correctly. Minerva is punishing Medusa for being raped. And that's messed up. And for those of you who know Minerva slash Athena, you know she normally wouldn't act this way. Athena is supposed to be the goddess of wisdom, and victim blaming a rape survivor is not the wise thing to do. Well, there's a reason for this out of character moment. And his name is Ovid. Ovid was a poet who lived during the beginning of the Roman Empire, and he was banished by Emperor Augustus for a lot of reasons which I'll list on screen now. Because he was banished by an autocratic leader of Rome, Ovid was not a big fan of authority. He couldn't directly criticize the Emperor because that would get him killed, 
so he instead decided to rewrite a few myths for the Roman religion. The odd thing is though, every story he rewrote has themes of anti-authoritarianism. This story of Medusa is a perfect example of his biases showing into his work. By making Medusa the victim of two horrible tragedies at the hands of the gods, Ovid is basically saying, hey, the people in charge do not care about the common folk. Though keep in mind, when he speaks to the common folk, it's really just literate men like himself. He doesn't care about the illiterate or the slaves. Medusa is an interesting figure. In Greek mythology, she was born, lived as, and died a monster. But when the Romans, specifically Ovid, came along, they painted her in a new light and turned her into a tragic victim at the hands of gods meddling with the mortals. Now even though I spent the last paragraph bad-mouthing Ovid for oversharing his bias in his writings, that shouldn't diminish his work. It's important to note that Ovid's work is very different from Hesiod's. Ovid is one man and he wrote many different myths for the Roman religion. Hesiod, meanwhile, likely collected various stories from all over Greece and put them all together in one place even though they were all likely oral traditions long before he came along. They're kind of hard to compare just because of how different they are. Ovid has his biases and they're clearly shown in his work, but Hesiod and Homer definitely had biases of their own. The only reason those aren't as clear is because we know less about the time period they came from than we do about Ovid. Hey, before I go, I want to tell you something epic. This video is part of a collaboration, but not just any collaboration. Nine mythology YouTubers and podcasters from the Mythology Multiverse Discord server have all teamed up to talk about various serpent creatures from mythologies around the world. We're calling it The Serpent Series. Be sure to check out the Serpent Series playlist and see the others' great videos. And once you're done watching those, come join the Mythology Multiverse Discord server. I hang out there and talk about mythology and just other tons of random stuff. We got a nice little community going there. Thank you for watching, leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you want to see more. I have a Twitter and Discord where I post memes, so you can go follow those if you want. And until next time, have a good one.